ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار dear brothers and sisters today i wanted to highlight one of the most beautiful qualities that a muslim should exhibit should show and that is forgiving others taking the high road turning the cheek having mercy on your brother or sister you know the quran emphasizes this attribute this quality and it's also cemented throughout many figures in our tradition and there is no better example but the example of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who always demonstrated this uh, quality of forgiving others of taking the high road of turning the other cheek of giving other people excuses no matter how much he was hurt one very prominent example of this was um well, well one prominent example of taking the high road not by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but abu bakr radhiyallahu an you know there was a time when um the muslims were out on an expedition and it was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sunnah to take one of his wives with him and so aisha radhiyallahu anha was uh, accompanying the prophet on this expedition and there was a moment of time where aisha radhiyallahu anha went to the side to relieve herself and when she came back she found that the muslims were gone that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the rest of the um, muslims were gone and so you know many times we may tell our kids that hey if you get lost stay where you are don't move we'll come and get you so aisha radhiyallahu anha thought the same thing that she would stay put where she was and so another thing that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to do um when he would go out is he would have someone lagging at the end it's a big armory naturally you might drop some stuff so the person at the end for this was safwan radhiyallahu an and when he catches up he sees a dark cloud on the ground so he decides to investigate and you know he exclaims la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah that this is a wife uh, this is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wife and aisha radhiyallahu anha narrates the story and says that safwan didn't say anything besides this she uh, safwan said nothing and so safwan radhiyallahu an you know dismounts his uh, ride and allows aisha radhiyallahu anha to get on and by the time they get they reach they catch up to the muslims aisha radhiyallahu anha says qalu ma qalu that the people said what they said the hypocrites thought that you know there's a man and a woman coming by themselves and they thought dirty thoughts they thought evil thoughts and they started spreading this rumor around that you know they there was an instance of fornication or zina going on and they spread this rumor of our mother aisha radhiyallahu anha and aisha radhiyallahu anha says when she got back to medina she fell sick for a month And so during this month she has no idea what's going on in Medina. And when she gets better or when she at one point moment she goes out she catches wind of the rumor. She hears what's going on. And she's devastated. And the story goes on and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala excuses Aisha radhiyallahu anha or you know 
clears, is a better word, clears Aisha anha of this rumor. And the part of the story I wanted to focus on is this part. Aisha anha had a relative by the name of Mistah radiallahu anha. He was a sahaba of, who participated in Badr. So, you know, the people who participated in the battle of Badr are the cream of the crop sahaba. But, because of the whispers of the shaitan, he fell prey to this rumor. And so, he also started spreading the rumor that there's something going on. And what ended up happening is, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, before this incident, would provide mista with a stipend, because he wasn't well-to-do. So he would provide a stipend to Mista. And after Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, I want to pause here, can you imagine a father hearing about someone who he supports talking ill of his family? And so he catches wind that Mista is talking bad about his family, so he suspends or stops providing Mista with this stipend. How much that hurts how much pain does that cause? That your own relative is the one stabbing you in the back. And not only that, you're helping this person. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse, وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُلُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ That don't let the, the, the ones who are affluent amongst you. وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُلِي الْقُرْبَى Swear that they will suspend the, their um, donations to their relatives. Walmasakin, the needy, wal muhajirin fi sabillah, and those who immigrated for the sake of Allah. Wal yafu wal yasfahu. Forgive and pardon. Allah to Hibuna in Yafir Allah Hulakum. Won't you don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? Wallahu Rafur Rahim. Allah is the most Rafur, He's the most forgiving and the most merciful. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, upon hearing this verse, he said, Bala, of course, of course I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. And you know, many of us may struggle. We've been hurt by other people, no doubt. People have hurt us through words or other means. And it might be hard to forgive, but it was never about you and the, your assailant, your attacker. It was about you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, in this story of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Abu Bakr didn't care what Mistah said. It was, don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? We have to forgive others. We have to be a community that exhibits mercy. If we want mercy on ourselves, we have to be people who forgive others. Imagine if every little thing that you did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't let go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held it against you until the day of judgment. And what was the motivation again of Abu Bakr radiallahu an? It wasn't that Mista will be your friend, Mista will do this, Mista will... No. It was, Ala tuhibbuna in yaghfirullahu lakum that don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Dear brothers and sisters, our religion is a religion that teaches us to overlook the mistakes of others. And of course, living in a society, we have to coexist. We have to learn to coexist with each other. And holding every little thing against each other is not healthy for ourselves, nor is it healthy to build a productive society, a productive community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for those who are able to forgive and overlook and take the high road, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ And hasten toward your Lord's um, forgiveness. وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ And a jannah, a garden that is as vast as the heavens and the earth. أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Prepared for those who are God conscious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains who are the God conscious in the very next ayah. أَلَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who spend in ease and adversity. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضِ And suppress their anger. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ And excuse the faults of other people. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the verse by saying Allah loves those who do ihsan because Suppressing your anger when some, or forgiving others when someone has rightfully hurt you is one of the hardest things to do. That's why it requires a level of ihsan going above and beyond. 
and forgive others with no conditions. You can only excuse the faults of other people when you have rightfully been hurt. When you have the absolute reason to be angry with somebody, that is when you excuse the faults of people. And that's when you forgive others. And because of that, Allah says, He loves those who do ihsan. In another place in the Quran, in Surah Shura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ That whoever excuses, excuses and conciliates or, and reconciliates فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Their reward is with Allah. And can you imagine, can you imagine doing something as hard as forgiving others? Something as difficult as forgiving others? How big the reward can be? How big al Karim, the one who is the most generous, can give. Dear brothers and sisters, we have to have that yaqeen. We can't worry that. Sure, it's hard. In the spur of the moment, it's easy to say whatever slips off our tongue. But again, we have to be cognizant. We have to remember that it was never about us and the person that is attacking us. It's about us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our want for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, our want to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while He is pleased with us. And it's this very characteristic of forgiving others, of having mercy on others that moves other people, that compels them to move towards you, towards your cause. And you know, many studies you'll see, if you study psychology, if you hold a grudge against somebody, if you hate somebody, if they've done something to you and you just can't seem to forget it, it steals your own happiness, it steals your own well-being. It, st- it disturbs your inner peace. But what happens if we let go of that thing we were so firmly grasping on? What happens if we let go of that grudge? We're able to live our life more happily. Without worrying about, oh, if I see so-and-so in a 20-mile radius, I'm going to walk the other way. Whereas, if we see so-and-so in a 20-mile radius, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, civil conversation. And, you know, that's exactly what happened during the life of the Prophet wasallam, when it was his continual practice of overlooking other people's shortcomings that compelled them to move towards Islam that compelled them to accept Islam. There was an instance where, um, you know, during the time of Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ, he was preaching in Mecca, and the people of Mecca rejected him. And so he sought out another town, another village, another city to preach the message of Islam to. And he thought, what better place than Ta'if because of its lush greenery, and so on and so forth. And so the Prophet ﷺ goes to Ta'if in the hopes that they would accept Islam, in the hopes that they would accept what he has to say. Yet he was met with utter humiliation, he was met with physical abuse, he was met with physical torture, to the point where he was bleeding, and he came to a tree to sit down, to take rest under and the angel of the mountains came, O oh, Prophet of Allah, if you would like, I would crush these people between these two mountains. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ had full ability to say, yes, do that. Yet we see, he said, no, perhaps their progenies will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in a moment where he had the ability to retaliate, even in a moment where he could get revenge, he didn't do so. He decided to withhold and show mercy. Another instance was when, when the Prophet ﷺ was walking and he was, you know, in Arabia, it was afternoon, so it was very hot. And the Prophet ﷺ met a lady who was walking a certain way. And the Prophet, you know, it's not common to walk during this time of day. So the Prophet ﷺ questioned, where are you going? And the lady says, an elderly woman, she says, you know, I'm leaving because of the person, because of Muhammad ﷺ. 
you know, she, she, was, she was against the Prophet ﷺ. She couldn't take it anymore. So, again, the lady doesn't know she's interacting with the Prophet ﷺ. And so the Prophet says, Oh lady, let me help you with your luggage. Let me help you with your luggage. And so they walk. They start going to the destination. And along the way, the lady is continuously bashing the Prophet ﷺ. And by the time they reach their destination, the lady asks, Let me get your name. You know, you've done such and such for me. You've done so good for me. Let me get your name. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ says who he is. And that compels him, that compels the lady, excuse me, to become Muslim, to accept Islam. Dear brothers and sisters, from these two stories, I wanted to highlight the component of responding to evil, responding to what is evil, to that which is better. When it comes to those who wrong you, there's, there are various ways to respond. And at one point or another, our relationships with each other, whether it's our brother or sister, whether it's our father, whether it's with our mother, with, whether it's with our co-workers, it will be tested. It comes with living in a society and living with others. But we have two options. When there is conflict, when there is rightfully so, we are able to be angry. If we are able to, we should forgive. We should overlook. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, if you do that, the person who you have enmity with, that person will be as if they were a close friend. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal maw'idhatil hasana Or excuse me, sorry, wala tastawu al hasana tu wala sayyi'ah That the, um, the evil and the good are not equal. Idfa' billati hiya ahsan Repel that which, which, that which is evil with that which is better. You'll see that the one you had enmity between, that they will be as if they were a sympathetic friend, a close friend. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us when we are met with evil, we repel it with something that is better. And that will strengthen our bonds that will make us a better community, that will make us people of mercy. Dear brothers and sisters, we have to remember when the Prophet ﷺ forgave matters, he forgave matters that were actual vulm, that were actual wrongdoings against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ. How about you and I? Are we holding grudges against somebody because they may have said something unknowingly? Or they maybe took a parking spot that we were waiting a long time to get? These petty matters. I'm not saying that we don't go and get help if we need it. We do that. But if we are in a position to forgive others, if we're able to forgive others, then that is better. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد. Dear brothers and sisters, in the first part of the khutbah, we talked about taking the high road, forgiving others, and repelling that which is evil with that which is better. And in the spur of the moment, when someone hurts us, it's easy to say whatever, to retaliate, but what is better is to forgive, to have mercy on our fellow brothers or sisters. Because you see, from the story I highlighted earlier, with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, it was never about you and your assailant. It was never about you and the person who attacks you. It was about you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he was being flogged by people because he wasn't listening to the Khalifa at the time. 
He didn't listen to what the Khalifa's orders were at the time. And so he was being flogged. And after the whole scenario, he said, he, he was asked, or he was told, you know, while you were being flogged, what was going through your mind? And Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, said that every single time I was flogged, I forgave the person. I forgave the person. He was wrongfully imprisoned, and he still forgave. And so the person who asked this question said, how? How is that even possible? Like you're being tortured, you're being tormented, and you're able to forgive in that situation? He said that, I know that the Prophet ﷺ loved everyone in his ummah. And I didn't want to be the reason for the Prophet Wasallam's sadness because I was cursing somebody. That level of faith, that level of mercy on other people. You see, again in this scenario, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, his focus was not on the person flogging him, his focus was his relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Dear brothers and sisters, I wanted to end with a hadith that, or an instance in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life that we may hear time and time again. You know, one, one time the Prophet was sitting with his companions and says, you know, that man right there, he's a man of Jannah. And so the companions got curious. What makes this person a man of Jannah? Because they all want to earn that level. And so one companion decided to follow. And after a few days, the companion says, you know, he fesses up. He says that, listen, the Prophet ﷺ said you're a man of Jannah, but I didn't see anything special that you did. It's not like you prayed extra to Hajjud. It's not like you were memorizing more Quran. It's not like you were doing this, that. I didn't notice anything. And the, compa- and the man says, you know, it's, you see what you get. So the man says, hold on. Hold on. There's one thing that I do that isn't apparent, meaning you can't see it. Every night before I go to sleep, I go to sleep with a clean heart. That means I don't hold grudges against anybody. I don't have envy against anybody. I don't envy anyone. I go to sleep with a clean heart. And again, I want you to notice the Prophet ﷺ classified this person as a man of Jannah, not because he was doing some advanced act of worship. It was something spiritual keeping his heart clean. (laughs) Keeping his heart clean of holding grudges against other people. Dear brothers and sisters, it's important, it's imperative when it comes to these situations, we remember the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for us. As he says, as I said earlier in the Quran, Ardu has samawatu wal ard, that a Jannah that is as vast as the heavens and the earth and is prepared for those who do ihsan, for those who forgive others. Because we know, we know when we've been hurt and we have the right to be angry, yet we still forgive, that requires a level of ihsan, a level of going above and beyond of what is required for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us big hearts to forgive others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us a community of mercy. I mean, Rabbana la tuziqulu bana ta'ada idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahma inna ka anta al-wahab Rabbana inna ka jami'un nasi liyawmin la rayba fi inna Allah la yukhifu al-mi'ad Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar inna Allah malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid ibadallah inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i zil qurba 
وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأقم الصلاة